Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And oh, there you go. welcome to uh, welcome to the first presentation of the fall 2004 27th Aerospace Lecture Series, uh, produced by the San Diego Aerospace Museum in collaboration with the local chapter of the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics. My name is Bruce Bleakley. I'm the Executive Vice President of the Museum, and we're happy to see all of you here this evening. Um, before we begin, I think we're going to try something this evening. Uh, I'll, I'm going to leave the door open and uh, just uh, see how that works. Since the city hasn't gotten around to uh, fixing our air conditioner yet, they'll probably get to that in the dead of winter. And the, uh, but for now, um, I'll just remind our guest speaker that he may have to do a starlight freeze. Uh, but I don't think it's that as noisy as it is out there in the um, in the amphitheater. So. Um, and I'd like to also, before we begin, thank uh, Mr. Jerry Williams, who is videotaping tonight's presentation. Mr. Williams, thank you very much uh, for our archives. I appreciate that. I was speaking with our uh, presenter this evening, uh, a little earlier, who was uh, telling us some nice things about his impressions of our museum. And we were talking about the fact that, well, we realize we'll never be as large as the Air Force Museum, the National Air and Space Museum, or some of the other larger museums. But what we uh, strive to do here in the museum to complement and to actually uh, provide the whole museum experience to what we feel is still a comprehensive collection of aircraft and space vehicles is to emphasize the quality and uh, comprehensiveness of our programming. And to that end, I just want to remind you of a few things that are coming up. First of all, the remainder of this lecture series, as I said before, this is the first of our fall lecture series. Uh, on the 21st of October, we'll have uh, Colonel Walter Cunningham, a lunar module pilot for the Apollo 7 mission, in which uh, our own astronaut Wally Sherall was the mission commander, and Don Isley was the command module pilot. On 11th November, on 11th of November, uh, you're going to find the answer that we all asked Walter Cronkite uh, while he was telling us all about how everything worked in the uh, uh, early space flight program, except telling us how they went to the bathroom. And uh, Mr. Donald Rethke, who has been working with NASA on uh, bioengineering systems for the later Apollo missions, Skylab, Space Shuttle, and so forth, uh, who also goes by the alter ego of Dr. Flush, is going to uh, <laughs> speak to us on the 11th of November. And for those of you that like to bring your young ones on the following Saturday, uh, Dr. Flush will make an appearance here at the museum. So uh, you can get more information about that uh, from the Education Department. And on the 18th of November, uh, Dr. Sally Wright, America's first woman in space, will give her first lecture, what I hope will be the first of several, uh, here at the museum. So we're looking forward to that. But in addition to the lecture series, we have several other programs. One of the things we strive to do here is to have a wide divergence of types of programs, both formal uh, structured programs, uh, informal activities, and everything in between. Our family days continue the second Saturday of uh, each month here in the museum, in the pavilion. The, if, if you have uh, a youngster that is working on their uh, entry for our scale model aircraft exhibition, tell them to hurry because uh, October the 20th is the evening that they're supposed to bring them in. And those will be on display uh, throughout the following four days here at the museum. And those that, although we call it a contest and not a, or rather a, an exhibition and not a contest, our International Distinguished Panel of Judge uh, awards uh, blue ribbons. And those blue ribbon awardees are kept on display here at the museum for an entire year. Our photo contest, our amateur photo contest, which we uh, started <coughs> recently, the deadline for that is the 8th of November. Uh, the theme is the colors of flight. We have a very special program. If you were at our Fighter Aces Symposium last December, we have decided to do something similar to that. This year it's called Wings of Valor, Medal of Honor Aviators. Uh, you're going to hear from five aviators who have been awarded the Medal of Honor for valor in aerial combat. Um, that will be on the 5th of December, a Sunday morning. And don't, uh, don't forget, uh, coming up on the 17th of December, we, after last year's uh, success with our 100th uh, anniversary of the, celebra of the uh, first uh, aircraft flight from the Wright brothers, we looked at each other and said, well, we don't have to wait and, and celebrate this every 100 years. Why don't we make this an annual event? So we're going to do that. 
um, on the 17th of December each year. This year it's on a Friday, so once again it will be a free day. We'll have special activities here, and we invite you all to come to that. Um, you'll see more about that in the newsletter that you're going to receive in about three weeks, I hope. <coughs> You may remember, if you were here a couple of years ago, at our uh, investiture ceremonies for our International Aerospace Hall of Fame, we invested Dr. Yvonne Getting, and, uh, uh, the, who was pretty much considered the father of the global positioning satellite system, the global positioning system. Um, and I just wanted to let our guest speaker know that we brought Dr. Getting's uh, portrait here to give him a little inspiration. And, um, and uh, this was a significant uh, uh, thing for us. Uh, it's, it's wonderful to be able to recognize uh, a living legend like Dr. Getting was. What, uh, what a fabulous mind uh, this gentleman had. Unfortunately, he left us last year, but we were privileged to invest him in the Hall of Fame while he was still with us. And uh, it was also through his efforts and with working with Boeing and the United States Air Force that we were able to obtain the only GPS satellite on display anywhere in the world, uh, which it hangs down in our spaceflight gallery. Uh, the rest of the, uh, of the actual satellites are in orbit and somewhat inaccessible. Um, anything you may see in another museum is a full-size mock-up or a, or a reproduction. Um, our guest speaker this evening uh, spent 22 and a half years in the Air Force, and during that time he split his engineering talents between aircraft and missile systems and aircraft. He, I um, worked on both heavy aircraft and fighter, uh, smaller type fighter jet aircraft. Um, he retired from the Air Force in 1997 and began uh, and to go to SAIC where uh, he's heavily involved in GPS and other systems uh, and he still works uh, in close uh, conjunction with the Air Force Space and Missile Systems Center. Uh, he has a Bachelor of Science in Engineering uh, from Rutgers University and a Master's Degree in Management from Georgia College and State University. He was involved in the launch of early GPS satellites and uh, worked with Dr. Getting on <coughs> later developments of the GPS. And uh, this evening he's brought with him uh, Mr. Peter Stopforth, most recently of the Royal Air Force, who is also with SAIC and also works with the Joint Program Office uh, in Los Angeles and is uh, also now at uh, SAIC. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Don Latterman. Huh? Okay. Well, it's my great privilege to uh, <coughs> be here today, uh, to be in uh, such great company as Yvonne Getting and uh, Dr. Sally Ride and uh, Walt Cunningham. Um, I'm just one of the team that helped make GPS possible. And all of us today are still working at making sure that we provide that national asset and international utility and continue to provide that to the world for, for the service it does to mankind. So you know, we represent just, just a small portion of that great team that, that brought this forward. I'd like to, again to thank uh, Peter Stopforth for coming with me this, this evening. Uh, Peter will give you some aviation perspective on that as a, as a pilot in his own right and uh, a member of the GPS team in the past. And uh, this evening, I think we're going to have some fun. Um, I want you to kick back and kind of listen. You know, some of, the, some of the things we'll talk about tonight are, are leading edge technologies, how GPS is going to change in the future, some of the things we're doing with GPS. And we've got some unusual things we'll talk about, too, that'll give you uh, maybe a little chuckle and, and some little insights into all the different things that we're actually doing with GPS today. And it truly is an enabling technology. It's not just GPS itself, it's what we can do with GPS. So we'll go ahead and uh, move forward on that. And um, I'd be more than happy tonight to stay as long as you guys will have me to answer any questions. And uh, so feel free to, to uh, use our question and answer period later or to uh, come on and grab me before the evening closes. And Peter and I would be more than happy to answer any questions about GPS. Okay, this is kind of what we'll talk about tonight, you know, what it is, how it's used. Uh, we'll talk about the system. Um, a lot of people think that, that S stands for satellite. The satellite is only part of the system. So GPS means global positioning system. Uh, we'll briefly talk about some of the history in general, talk about how it works, and then we're going to talk about where GPS is going in the future, and I kind of call that GPS plus because there's other systems out there which augment the capability of GPS, make GPS better. And then there are other systems being fielded by other nations, 
the, uh, the Russians now, the Russian Federation, and the European Union and Galileo. And they're developing, of course, they're in, have, the Russians have already put you know, on orbit their own navigation systems. And we're going to talk about what we call GNSS, or a global navigation satellite system, of which GPS is part. And then finally, we've got some uh, interesting little uses of GPS. I've got a couple of slides at the end that talks about how to pick a GPS receiver and what are some good qualities to find in one if you you'd like to go to your favorite boating and backpacking store and, uh, and buy one. OK, uh, basically, you have to remember that GPS is a space-based navigation radio system. OK, it's very much like the, the car in your radio, uh, GPS, um, the things, the little handhelds you see that the boaters, the backpackers, the hikers use, uh, what you install in your aircraft to receive the GPS signals is the receiver. It's just like your car radio. It's a radio frequency. Uh, the system itself is made up of three parts. And we like to categorize them as the uh, ground, the operational control segment, which really controls this constellation of 24 satellites. The space segment, which is the satellites themselves, and then where the rubber really meets the road, or like we like to say in the Air Force, the pointy end of the spear, is the uh, user equipment or the actual GPS receivers that utilize the signals. Now, when GPS was founded, we started with two uh, levels of service, which really are still in play today, and we'll talk about how that's going to change in the future. But we have what we call the SPS, or the Standard Positioning Service, and if you own a GPS receiver, um, that's the service it, it operates under. It's a single frequency, and it's a single code that's freely available to all users worldwide. The military side of the house operates in what we call the PPS, or Precise Positioning Service, and that's a dual frequency system. The GPS receivers used by the military receive two frequencies, not one. And it's also encrypted, so the military can use it with relative confidence that it's not being compromised by an enemy. Um, and it requires a crypto key for a military user to, to access that service. And this is how the system was originally set up. And there's some changes coming to that, and we'll, we'll talk about those in, as we go through the briefing. And it kind of gives you the difference in the relative accuracies, too. Uh, the system was really st start set up such that there was a 100 meter accuracy for on the ground 2D navigation, i.e. ship or troop, and then the precise positioning service was uh, a 16 meter spherical ball we call SEP. So it was much more accurate for the military user, and we'll talk about why. Talk a little bit about how it used, uh, how GPS is used. Uh, this is an example of some civil applications because uh, I've talked to a lot of ex-military folks tonight, so we'll, we'll talk some of the military things too. But I, most of you folks are, are really civil users of GPS. And you can see some of the typical applications that we're now using GPS for. These are the kind of questions that GPS helps us answer on an everyday basis. What is your current position? Where are you? You've got to realize this is the first time in history that a, a, an invention like GPS solves one of the basic needs of mankind to know where you are. Now with GPS, you can always know exactly where you are. And just think of the magnitude of that. How far you've traveled, how long you've been traveling, what your average, average speed is. Our, our breadcrumb trail here is, refers to waypoints that you can leave markers as you go to mark certain positions so you can retrace that trail, much like Hansel and Gretel in the, in the breadcrumbs. talk about now is the system itself. Uh, the constellation itself is basically a 24 satellite <coughs> constellation. The satellites are in six planes, four satellites per plane, and actually on, on orbit now we actually have 29 satellites. And the constellation is populated like that because at some point we know some of those satellites are getting older, they're going to have to be replenished, so we've moved satellites into uh, relatively close positions we call slots, so we can then move the newer, fresher spacecraft into uh, those operational slots to replace the old ones. So how does it work? Well, the space segment really generates the signal, but the real brains of the system is in what we call the control segment on the ground. And our master control station is at Shriver Air Force Base in Colorado Springs. 
That's the nerve system, nervous, central nervous system of GPS, if you want to look at it that way. And then information is uploaded from the ground station through the ground antennas to the satellites themselves. And then the, we have a monitor station, or series of monitor stations, we'll talk about more, more about those in a second, that actually monitor the performance of the constellation. And the whole key to operation of GPS is the accuracy of the atomic clock. Because in order, at, at the speed of light, which radio signals travel in a vacuum, a foot error is a nanosecond, or a billionth of a second in time. So in order for GPS to be extremely accurate, you have to have a, an atomic clock to do the trick. And the atomic clocks are actually on the satellites. And then, of course, the satellites broadcast their signal back to the receiver. And like I said earlier, the receiver just receives the signal, much like your car radio. And the military folks like that because that's stealthy. You have a soldier who knows where he or she is, and they don't have to broadcast, they don't have to give away their position to, to an enemy. Again, our segments, um, let's see where my laser pointer works. Um, this is the civil code we call L1. It's broadcast on the L1 frequency on a single channel. We have the, this, the military signal here, which is composed of an L1 signal and an L2 signal on which we broadcast the PY code, which is the military code, and also the, the civil signal on the CA. And then we have our CQ, or our C squared, which is our command and control of the constellation itself. So we have to communicate back up to the satellites, and that's done through the master control station, because we want to give those satellites updates to make sure they're where they should be, and that the time that they're producing is as accurate as it should be. Okay, 24 satellites, six planes. Um, these are the satellites that are currently uh, on orbit right now. Whoops, let's go back. Uh, the Block 2, Block 2As are on orbit. I think we only have three of those left. And the Block 2Rs right now are the, really the current heart of the current constellation. And I'll show you where they are uh, graphically in a second. The Block 2F will be the next generation. Uh, these are in production right now at Boeing uh, in Seal Beach, uh, up the freeway a bit, which uh, used to be uh, part of Rockwell. And uh, each satellite has its own uh, atomic clock. Uh, the al altitude of the satellites is interesting in the fact that it's basically what we call a semi-synchronous orbit. Um, it's a basically close to a very close to a 12-hour period orbit. So every 12 hours, each GPS satellite comes back over the same, same spot on the Earth. And the constellation was designed that way because they felt to in order to keep GPS very accurate that they'd have to contact the satellite um, at least twice a day to upload the clocks to make sure they were accurate and to provide information on the constellation configuration itself. And uh, the satellites are now in a 55 degree inclination with the Earth, which provides good coverage. And the satellites are actually launched from Cape Canaveral right now, although the very first GPS satellites were launched from Vandenberg Air Force Base uh, just up the coast. Our developmental satellites, when I was a young officer, I had the, uh, the wonderful experience of uh, launching probably the third Navstar satellite out of Vandenberg Air Force Base. I was there from, um, supported that operation for probably about eight launches. And uh, we put up some of the very first GPS satellites out of Vandenberg. But the current generation is being launched from the Cape. Uh, this diagram is, is a little hard to follow, but the letters at the bottom are the key here. These are the planes that the satellites are in, and each one of these little colored squares is actually a satellite. And as you can see, 59 and 33 are kind of close together here because one of these may be a replenishment for the other. Uh, the highlighted ones in <coughs> yellow are actually our replenishment launches. These are going to be the next three launches that uh, we're going to plan to do and how we're going to populate the rest of the constellation. The little color code over here shows you which generation of satellite these are from. So as far as the block twos, yeah, we only have two, two left. Okay, so the heart of our constellation now is the block 2As and the block 2Rs. And this kind of shows you how they're configured in that plane, uh, two of them a little bit closer together and the two a little bit set further apart to give the constellation better geometry. Here's our Delta launch vehicle, uh, launched from the Cape. 
Uh, the satellite is actually launched into what we call an elliptical transfer orbit, okay? And then there's a, a, a solid rocket motor that's actually built into the body of the satellite we call the apogee kick motor. And the AKM then fires and circularizes that orbit. So the final GPS orbit is, is circular. Uh, future launches uh, after our Block 2 satellites here, I'm sorry, our, our Block 2F, starting with our Block 2F satellites, will be on the next generation of space launch vehicle we call the EELV, or ex Evolved Expendable Launch Vehicle. And in that case, that launch vehicle has enough horsepower to take the GPS satellite directly into its final orbit, and we call that direct inject. So a cartoon that talks about the characteristics of the signal. I won't get into a lot of the details for you, but I'll highlight some things here that I think are very important. Um, these are the two frequencies that the um, GPS signals operate, L1, the civil signal, and L1 and L2 for the military signal. And um, the GPS operates in what we call uh, CDMA, or code division multiple access. And this makes it fundamentally different than some of the other systems that are out there right now. Uh, Galileo, which is the, the Soviet system, or now the Russian Federation system, uh, works on what we call frequency uh, divided um, multiple access, or FDMA. And they broadcast separate frequencies. The GPS satellites all broadcast on these, these two frequencies, okay? So if you were to pick them up, you only need a radio or a GPS receiver that receives those two frequencies to get them and your little civil receivers that you'll buy uh, in the boating backpacking stores uh, basically receive just the L1 frequency. So they're very, very simple. It, it keeps the cost of the receiver down and reduces the complexity of the system. Uh, <clears throat> there's two things that the GPS satellite uh, primarily produces. It produces what we call a ranging signal, number one, because it helps you determine how far you, as a, as a receiver of the GPS signal, are from the GPS satellite. The CPS satellites are actually your reference frames. Uh, one of the sayings that Yvonne Getting had was the fact he called GPS lighthouses in the sky. Because each one of those satellites was a reference point, a fixed reference point, because we knew exactly where that satellite was. It was as fixed as a lighthouse was. And this kind of gives you an idea of the information that's actually contained in the second portion of the equation is what we call the navigation message. And the navigation message is broadcast with the GPS signal. And it basically gives you the housekeeping information. It helps keep the clocks very accurate. So when you receive the signal on your receiver, you know if there's a correction you're going to have to make because the clock is off a little bit. It also provides what we call the ephemeris, which is the positioning of the satellites in the constellation. The operation of GPS is very simple. It's distance times time. As long as you know the distance from you to the satellite and how long it took to get there, you can determine your position. And the beauty of it is the fact that you really need an atomic clock to be that accurate to get that level of accuracy. Okay. Um, one of the things the Department of Defense did in order to protect um, our ability to use GPS from a potential enemy is the fact that DOD intentionally degraded the GPS signal. And we call this function selective availability, okay? And what happened was when the system was conceived, we thought that um, a uh, potential enemy could use GPS against us because anybody could receive this signal. So we set up the two services where the civil signal was not as accurate as the military signal. And the civil signal was degraded by this function we call uh, selective availability. And that actually affected the clock. So it, dis it, it had an error it introduced into the GPS clock. So the GPS clock time was a little bit off. So if it was a nanosecond or two, that affected your GPS position by two or three or five feet. So the clock was what we call dithered, and intentionally we, we put that distortion into the system. Um, what has happened since then was President Clinton um, and some of the uh, congressional uh, work that was done prior to that to really look at uh, the benefits to the United States uh, directed in uh, 2000 that uh, the use of SA be discontinued, and the DOD turned SA to zero, 
and all of a sudden the reception of your civil GPS receivers went up in terms of accuracy by about a, a magnitude of 10. So the SA is no longer used on your GPS signal. So your GPS signal today is much more accurate than it had been in the past. We also have a feature of the military signal we call anti-spoofing. And this is an encryption of the signal we talked about earlier. It requires a crypto key that's inserted into the GPS receiver, either electronically or physically, uh, to gain access to this. And that's to protect uh, um, an enemy from using a more accurate GPS against us. Okay? Well, what happened really was, and why President Clinton uh, thought it was a good idea that we turn off our selective availability, was the civil market became very inventive and developed ways to really get around what we were trying to do. So they said, well, you know, this is no longer an effective countermeasure. Let's not use it. We'll turn it off. And everybody has the benefit of a much more accurate GPS signal. And that was because the Department of Defense developed other ways of dealing with an enemy using GPS or GPS-guided weapons that didn't require this global denial of high access capability to the general public. Okay. And the thing that really brought this about is something we call differential GPS. And if you've seen some of the road working crews around lately um, that are carrying around a backpack with a little, little white GPS antenna on the top of the pole, they're doing differential GPS. And differential GPS is a very highly accurate form of GPS. And it's actually used by the surveyors down to the millimeter level. In some states now, GPS is accepted as a legal means of survey. Okay, so how did they do that? Well, it takes two receivers to do that. You have what we call a reference station, which is set at a very precisely surveyed point on the face of the earth. And you set that reference station out there, and then your little backpack and your portable antenna is basically what we call a rover. And that person is mo moving around, and he's taking GPS readings as they move from point to point. Well, what happens is the errors in the GPS system that are induced primarily by the transmission of the signal through the atmosphere and the local phenomena, those errors are washed against once another, one another between the two receivers because they're both looking at the same atmosphere. They're usually not very far apart, but it could be kilometers apart. But effectively, you're looking through the same part, portion of the universe. So by understanding what the common errors are between the two receivers, you can subtract them out. And what happens is the reference station receiver determines that difference, broadcasts the corrections back to that using receiver, the rover, so they can make the appropriate corrections to their spot. So that's how differential GPS worked. And that, that was a very effective technique to make GPS much more accurate and it led to the decision by President Clinton to turn off DOD's selective availability because it wasn't really an effective countermeasure anymore. Okay, this is, a, this is kind of an interesting chart because it shows you the accuracy of GPS. This is the accuracy of, I think in this case it was dual frequency. But this is the overall accuracy of the GPS signal at the time. And you can see it's oscillating, you know, maybe even as much as 100 meters here and there. Okay. However, as soon as selective availability was turned off, this is the level of accuracy you're getting now. So this was the amount of distortion that was placed in the GPS signal by the Department of Defense as, as a countermeasure. And once that was turned off, you can see the difference in the level of accuracy. Um, this, is, this is current data. Um, let's see here. I thought I had the data up here. Um, this is for the year to date from January. Um, this data comes from the monitor station at Shriver Air Force Base in Colorado from our uh, organization we call the TUSOPS, or the Second Space Operations Squadron. And they are the ones charged with monitoring and operating the satellites. And here you can see how accurate GPS is on basically the, the 95th percentile. So 95% of the time, GPS right now is this accurate which is right around five meters. And if you were looking at a 50-50 number, it's less than two meters. So again, it depends on what kind of statistics you want to look at. But GPS in its own right 
as, as the signal you're receiving is become very, very accurate. As far as the uh, operational control segment is concerned, this is the, the really brains of the system. And um, the purpose of the OCS is really to monitor system performance and make adjustments to it to make sure GPS stays as accurate as it possibly can. And what we have is a network of ground stations. We have tracking stations. Let's, there we go. And we call those monitor stations. We actually monitor um, all the satellites in view. They collect r data on the range to the satellite. They monitor the, the navigation signal. And they provide that information back to the master control station in Colorado Springs. So we know how to adjust the orbits of the satellites or how to adjust the clock corrections to make sure they have accurate time. And what the Air Force is going to be doing now is we have the National uh, uh, Geoimagery uh, Agency, or NGA, which was previously NEMA, uh, has tracking stations at other uh, parts of the world. And we're going to piggyback on their locations. Those are here marked in the little red triangles, or the little red uh, uh, diamonds. So we ha now have a network of our six original stations uh, con in conjunction with a master control station at Trever, and six more from NGA. So now we'll have 12 stations across the globe in order to more accurately measure and monitor our constellation, which will increase the accuracy of GPS even more. Okay, and like I said, the master control stations in Colorado Springs, operated by our friends at the TUSOPs, and these are the folks that actually fly the satellites. These are the sergeants, the young lieutenants, the young captains who sit on what we call crew duty every day at a console and fly those GPS satellites. They prepare the uploads that correct our clock and ephemeris errors. They perform maneuvers to adjust those orbits so they're highly accurate. And they're on shift 365 days a year, 24-7, and uh, work in rotating uh, eight-hour shifts. So those folks there are very proud of the work that they do to keep GPS operating. And these are the things, this is the data that's actually sent over the nav message. Again, everything is distance and time. So it's the importance of an accurate, what we call ephemeris, where the, where the satellites actually are, and the clocks themselves. Um, we also broadcast an ionospheric model, which helps correct some of the distortion of the signal in the atmosphere. Um, we'll talk about the rough ride from space in a, in a few more minutes. But what affects the GPS signal the most now that selective availability is turned off is the distortion of that signal as it comes back to the atmosphere. You've got to remember the satellites are out, that, out there over 10,000 miles. And there's a good distance coming back in a lot of atmosphere that signal has to pass through. And if you remember from physics, you know, light travels at uh, the speed of light only in a vacuum. So the GPS signal gets slowed down as it transfers uh, from the satellite to the ground. So therefore, it induces some error in the accuracy of GPS. And when we're talking about a billionth of a second being roughly equivalent to a foot in distance, every little bit of delay causes more error in the system. And as we want it to be more and more accurate, we're doing everything we can to wring out uh, all those errors from the system. And then we, the TUSOPS communicates with the satellite itself and does maneuvers. You know, when we get the satellite on orbit, we have to do several things to prep it for final operations, make sure it's in the correct orbit, and it actually commands the satellite. So these guys are in touch with the satellites on a normal operational basis and as we put our new satellites into orbit. Okay, and this gives you an idea of what those folks do on an everyday basis. This is the number of navigation uploads they make every day. These are the numbers of contacts with the spacecraft. So those folks every day you know, might be doing as many as you know, 30 or 40 or 50 or 60 uploads to the constellation to maintain that level of accuracy. And you can see the level of activity here was kind of at a peak. This may have been uh, at that time to support activities in Iraq, for example. Uh, we do things like very selective uploads to improve the accuracy of GPS uh, just before we have to do operations. So, you know, this, this might have had uh, direct influence on an activity that was actually happening on the ground. 
But this gives you an idea of how much workload it takes to maintain the GPS constellation. These folks are talking to those spacecraft this much each day. And an average upload is somewhere around 30 minutes a crack. So it's, it's a lot of work. Uh, the other end of the uh, pointy end of the sphere, we like to say again, um, the triad, if you will, of the space control and grounds uh, segment is what we call our military user equipment, or UE. And these are the GPS receivers themselves. So these are the military receivers that we put um, on our aircraft, um, Navy ships, submarines. It's just kind of a, for those of you who have been in the service, uh, understand that you know, most, uh, most things that are painted gray uh, probably go somewhere on a Navy ship. Um, some things that are painted green over here probably went on an Army helicopter. But um, this, this shows you the, the, not only the, uh, the size, but also the magnitude and the, and the ruggedness that we build GPS equipment with to, to serve our forces. So these guys you can't go downtown and buy, but you will find them on your F-16, um, for example. Uh, this is our, our MAGR here, which is a, uh, a smaller, lighter version of our original set of equipment uh, we designed for the F-18. Uh, they, Mar the Marines AV-8B um, and two of the other aircraft, uh, Air Force aircraft, one of which was the F-15. So this will give you an idea of what military GPS equipment looks like. This is a GPS antenna. This antenna is an is a anti-jam antenna. It actually forms nulls or uh, decreases the amount of power the antenna sees uh, if there was a jammer or somebody was you know, doing hostile things against uh, one of our aircraft. And um, we got our little Magellan over here on the bench. Maybe we'll play a little bit with that later. But this is this little guy over here is the plugger, and this is a handheld GPS receiver that we used uh, are using primarily now in Iraq. And one of the things that the troops don't like uh, like about it, like about it is it's big and heavy. So, you know, DoD right now is in the process of buying a much more commercial sized lightweight, small GPS receiver that the troops will be able to use. This is an example of some of the things that uh, GPS receivers that you can, you can buy in boating backpacking stores. Um, a lot of our folks we talked to tonight um, have the little Garmin's here. These are quite popular because um, I think at Fry's Electronics you can buy uh, the little Garmin E-Trex for about $69. And, uh, and they're quite, quite good little tools, especially with uh, no selective availability. Uh, you have things too like your, your in-car sets and uh, moving map displays uh, here, kind of like you'd see an aftermarket uh, set for your car. OK, let's talk about the satellites and, and modernization. Some of the things that are happening right now is we're kind of into the next phase of GPS. And these are the original satellites um, that populated our constellation so far. Uh, we're going to add some additional capability to our block to our satellites. We actually have these satellites built, and we're going to go back and modify those and put this capability into those satellites. We're currently launching those out of Cape Canaveral, and as we launch those, we'll backfill with another one. But we're in the process of taking the others back to the factory and modifying them to put some additional signals on. And these signals are going to be to benefit mostly the civil user. We're going to give the civil users two signals, just like the military folks have, so they have more accuracy. And, and the other thing, too, we're going to do a new encrypted military code for the military user. And we're going to add some more power to the signal, too. Because like I said earlier, GPS is a very low power signal. So it's very vulnerable. So we want to get some more power in there. Um, after that, we're going to go forward in the next generation and block GPS-3 here, we're going to add another improved civil signal on the original L1 frequency. Um, GPS-3 is going to also have the capability to uh, do something we, we're calling here uh, navigation assurity, but we also call that integrity. Uh, integrity is the confidence you have in your GPS solution, that you know it's right. And that's very important for someone that's trying to land an aircraft here in San Diego, for example. And the FAA certifies um, navigation systems based on their ability, their reliability, their ability to detect uh, faults in the system such that they know if the system is errant that it actually uh, puts out that information. The original GPS constellation did not. 
and did not have that capability. And we have to go back and add that. And we'll talk a little bit later about some of the civil systems that already have that built in. And these are just some, some kind of little cartoons of the signals themselves that kind of show you the frequencies and some of the advantages that each one of them have. Uh, this is the new civil signal on L2. Uh, this is our new civil signal ca we're calling L5. This one is very important to uh, safety of life services like navigation because this signal's in a protected band. You gotta remember that not all frequencies out there are well protected by international treaty. And what happens then is somebody else can build something that interferes with your operation. And that's protected by international treaty. L5 is in what we call the radio navigation band and is specifically designated for radio navigation. So it's protected from the west, rest of the world intruding on it. And this is very important to the FAA because again, it's part of certifying GPS for a high accuracy use in navigation for aviation. And then we're going to go back and we're going to add another, uh, we're going to actually modify our civil signal on L1. And part of the issue here too is we're looking at making this signal compatible with the European system, Galileo. So now if this, and actually a few weeks ago this was agreed to between the United States and the EU such that they would have one common signal between the two systems. And this will probably be the signal that the uh, European U Union provides for free, such that GPS receivers can use it and the new Galileo receivers will be able to use that signal too. Okay, I'll walk you real quick through our history. Um, really, it all goes back to when Sputnik was launched because when Sputnik was launched, Sputnik broadcast a, a signal at tone. And what we observed was what we call a Doppler effect is that the frequency changes as the distance from the observer changes. And this was one of the basic principles for the foundation of some of our following uh, navigation systems of which, of which the first one was transit. And it measured this Doppler shift of satellites on orbit to calculate position. GPS really came from two other programs, one called Timation which was the Navy, Air, uh, Navy program at the Naval Research Laboratory in Washington. And it was the first to really use the precise uh, clocks on orbit. The Air Force portion of that program was called 621B. And it demonstrated the technology at that time of using the technique to generate our unique pseudo-random noise codes, which are how each satellite identifies itself. Each satellite broadcasts what we call a PRN, and that lets the receiver know which satellite it's communicating with. And then the Joint Program Office, which Peter and myself are graduates of and still do a lot of work for, was formed at Los Angeles Air Force Base in 1973 with some really key contractors and some very, very smart military folks and support from people like Yvonne Getting at Aerospace Corporation and Brad Parkinson, who was our first uh, program director. Okay, and then we went on to some initial ground testing, which was kind of unique, and that was done out over at the Yuma Proving Grounds. And the interesting thing about this was we used what we call pseudolites, which was we put the satellites on the ground because we didn't have any satellites in orbit. We wanted to prove the concept. So the satellites were actually put on the ground in terms of all the electronics that the satellite would have and the GPS signal was generated. So in order to try to simulate real world usage, we radiated the signals from the ground and flew the aircraft over the range to do the reception. So we kind of had what we call the inverted range or inverted GPS. And that's how the system was actually tested. And this gives you a chronology of, of all the satellites um, in their sequence of development and uh, when they were uh, put on orbit. Okay, how does it work? Well, we talked about a lot of those features. Ah, here we go. Here's our little observer. Okay. We have a Copernicus here looking at the stars. And actually, he's looking at a GPS spacecraft, or at least a, a block diagram of one. And he notes that the time right now is exactly 12 midnight. Okay, now, 
He figures out that it's now one second later. So what has happened? Well, light has traveled during that time frame, and light travels at the speed of light. And it took one second from the, the message to get from the satellite to the ground, to the observer. So therefore, we know it's traveling. At that speed, we know that it's 1,800, one, 186,000 miles away. So that's the basic principle behind ranging. It's just very simple. It's you, if you know exactly when the signal was sent from the spacecraft and when it was received, and it travels at the speed of light, you know how far you are from that spacecraft. Okay? But you know how far you are from that spacecraft, but you don't know exactly how that relates to where you are on the face of the Earth, because all you know is your distance to one point. So this is called the principle behind time of arrival ranging, or TOA, which is the basis for GPS. So if we do our calculations, we figure out that if the signal really travels at the speed of light, it really boils down to the fact that you need an atomic clock because at those speeds, about a foot is one nanosecond. So the only way GPS was going to work was to have atomic clocks with that level of accuracy. Whoops. Okay, like I said earlier, um, now you know your range to one satellite, and that tells you where you are somewhere within one of those spheres, because that's your lighthouse in the sky. Each one of those satellites, you know that if you're somewhere in, on the surface of this ball is all you can tell from one satellite. If you put two satellites together and you take two measurements, now the intersection between two spheres is a circle. So you know that you're now somewhere on that circle, but you still don't know exactly where. So you need to take look at three satellites for a three-dimensional solution and now you know, if you put three of them together, the intersection between the three spheres is two points. So you know you're at one of the two points. And usually what happens is the fact that one of those two points is an impossible solution. It's somewhere inside the Earth or on the other side of the Earth, and the, the other solution is the correct solution. So we call that trilateration. Okay. And basically, the receiver does the calculations. The receiver is basically a small computer. Um, the receiver does its calculations basically using the simple principles discussed earlier. And it generates a solution. The civil receivers generate a solution every second. So if you have your little watch size Garmin, every second it's generating a new solution and a new position. That's how accurate and that's how fast it is. And if you do all the math, here's the math. But <laughs> we, there, will, there won't be a test after this. You can, ask, you can ask all the questions you want. But basically, you need, you, in order to find a three dimensional, um, to get a three dimensional solution, you have to solve four equations. And these are the four equations. And that allows you to calculate your error because each of those ranges are a little bit off. And like we said, with that level of accuracy, you have to, be, you have to eliminate every, every, every bit of error. So if you're a little bit off, and we call that measurement the pseudo range, because it's a false range. It's a range with a little bit of error in it. So the name of the game is to try to take the error out of all those measurements. And you do that by looking at multiple satellites. You find the differences between those and what is broadcast in the message, the nav message, from the satellite itself. The satellite broadcasts its ephemeris. It says, I should be right here. Well, that's where it should be, and I got a range that's telling me it's a little off, so that's my error, and then I need to go and correct that and apply those corrections to the rest of my calculations. And that's basically how it, the receiver comes up with the solution. Okay. Um, these are the things that affect the signal. Like we said, the signal is very sensitive to time delays because these measurements are so accurate and so small. And we talked about clock and ephemeris. This is knowing where the satellites are, the ephemeris. 
and the accuracy of the atomic clock itself, what errors are in the clock, because the clocks aren't perfect either. And we have to constantly recalibrate those clocks, and that's what the message from the master control station does. It updates the clocks and updates the ephemerates. So we've talked about those two errors, and those are errors primarily in the signal itself. Now, once that signal is generated and it leaves the satellite, we have the effects of the ionosphere, which is the next biggest effect. We have the effect of the troposphere, which is the next layer of the Earth. And the ionospheric error has a lot to do with free electrons in the atmosphere that cause disturbances. Those free electron disturbances, you can sometimes see those as aurora borealis, or the northern lights. And those definitely affect GPS. Matter of fact, we had a, uh, a great increased frequency of the aurora a few years ago. And there was a lot of fervor about um, that activity because that was caused by uh, increased solar flares um, on the sun affecting the uh, reaction of the ionosphere on the Earth. And there was a lot of concern about will we lose GPS or how accurate would GPS be because of the reaction of the ionosphere. So that's the next biggest error. And you got to remember we're taking these little bit of errors out because we need to make it really accurate. Next thing is the troposphere. Troposphere error has a lot to do with the moisture in the air. So um, in the navigation message, we provide a tropospheric model, which allows a single frequency receiver, a civil frequency receiver, to calculate better by using a model. The way the military receivers deal with this is because they have two frequencies, they use an actual measurement of the delay through the atmosphere for both the IONO and the TROPO, and they can subtract that out. So that's why the military receivers are more accurate. And then you get something that has to do with satellite geometry, and we call this DOP, or dilution of precision, especially in terms of its geometry. The closer the satellites are together, the greater the error is on your position on the ground, simply be to <coughs> due because of the geometry of the, of the satellite constellation itself. Too close together, you get a larger dispersion than if they're far apart where you have better view angles. And the receiver is going to decide which satellites it's going to look at. And there's lots of things that affect um, the receiver actually choosing which satellites it will choose to look at. Um, the other thing that can happen is poor satellite visibility. In other words, you could stand in front of a building and all of a sudden, where's my GPS reception? Well, you're standing between uh, you and the, and the satellite is the building. So uh, those things can happen too. And GPS is not really good indoors either. Um, if you see indoor systems right now for GPS navigation, uh, what they're doing is actually rebroadcasting uh, the GPS signal. So they're receiving it, rebroadcasting it at a higher power so you can receive it inside the building. But your GPS receiver doesn't work too good inside. Um, the other thing that can happen too is uh, what we call a multipath. Uh, multipath is bouncing of the signal. If you're standing next to a building, for example, uh, an aluminum hangar is a, is a real good one on an Air Force base, for example. The signal from space is coming down and it can be reflected off the building. So the receiver is receiving that signal after it normally would have coming directly from the satellite. So it's inducing an error in the time of that signal. So that's multipath. And then the last one is actually noise in the receiver itself. And that has a lot to do with how well the receiver is designed electronically. Uh, our rough trip to Earth, uh, this is just kind of a, a cartoon illustrating the fact that the uh, largest GPS errors due to the atmosphere are because of the ionospheric and tropospheric disturbances we talked about earlier. Okay. And then w we did talk about satellite geometry and how that was affected also. Yeah, and this will give you, this little cartoon here actually kind of shows the two examples where you have good DOP or good geometry and a, and a better GPS solution if the satellites are spread further apart than if they're close together. And this gets into the effects of, you know, where the satellites actually are, for example, and it also has to do with where you are. I mean, if you're in a canyon and you can't see all the GPS satellites, you may not have good DOP because you don't, you don't have a good angle of view. This also gets affected, too, at the high latitudes, say, um, the northern areas of Canada or Scandinavia, uh, where you're combining the deep, fjord and canyons with the fact that the 
satellites are not elevated high enough, high enough from the horizon to see down into the canyon. So you're getting blockage, you're getting poor geometry too. So you may have a little less accuracy in those areas of the world. And then of course, you have bad visibility. The building could be blocking the signal. Um, this one didn't come out for me. I apologize for that. I was going to take this one out. But it actually shows the error budget and kind of discusses each one of those errors in detail with some, some numbers associated with it. But as I had the rank ordered earlier, they're from the most impacting to the least impacting. Okay, let's talk about what's happening now in the future. And I like to call that GPS plus. Because we have something we call augmentations. And augmentations are things that add to GPS or are based on GPS. And those are better refinements of the system by using other techniques. We also have other space-based navigation systems which are completely independent from GPS. And those are GLONASS from the Russian Federation and Galileo being developed by the European Union. Although we have some commonality with the European system, but they're separate systems. So they're GPS-like. But augmentations really use GPS to do something better. Okay, um, we'll talk about the GNSS, which is the Global Navigation Satellite System. And this, again, is the combining of all space-based navigation systems into a single capability. GPS is, is part of this larger picture. You know, there was a long time there when GPS was the only space-based navigation system. But that's changed today. Every, there's a lot of people out there that have figured out that this is really a great thing to have. And our friends in the European Union in particular are very excited about developing their own system they call Galileo. And these other systems provide different levels of service. The Russian system, or GLONASS, is still a little, I won't say immature, but not well maintained. There are only about 10 GLONASS satellites on orbit right now. GLONASS operates in three planes, and they only really have satellites in two planes. So the geometry is not really good. However, recently the Russian Federation has reemphasized their commitment to you know, making GLONASS a much more viable uh, navigation system. So anyhow, but as far as, as we're concerned, you know, this is, you know, this is a, a global picture right now, and GPS is just, just part of that. Um, the military situation here is the fact that GPS came from the Department of Defense and we used it primarily initially for military purposes. However, we'll have to do a similar thing when we look at our other space-based navigation systems as Galileo. What will our military be able to use in terms of having that capability coming from a foreign host, the European Union, or even the Russian system? So those are things we have to think about as, as war fighters and we have to operate you know, globally. As far as the civil side of the house, really our aviation organizations have really led the charge here because GPS did not necessarily have some of the key features needed by the safety of flight requirements um, for the FAA and the other international flight organizations to certify uh, the capability of GPS to do very precision landings, they had to go and develop um, other systems, other augmentations to GPS in order to get that level of confidence. And we'll talk about Wasson specific in a few minutes. So we have to also look at the civil requirements too. And safety of life is much different than a military operation. Okay, Galileo. Um, we put together this quick summary on where, where we are with Galileo. Um, but basically, it is a, a GPS-like system. Um, the unique thing about Galileo is Galileo offers levels of service, okay? And I think there's five separate levels, one of which is a free service, which is much like our civil CA code we have right now. And that'll be free to the world also. And when we were talking earlier about making those civil, uh, those civil signals interoperable, uh, such that GPS have, has one and, and uh, Galileo has one, uh, that would probably be the, the free civil service. However, there's four other layers that are pay for services, fee for user. And the Europeans plan on generating a lot of revenue based on selling their access to their system, whereas 
in the United States, DOD is the steward of GPS, and we provide that through your tax dollars. So there's a lot of discussion about that too because the um, U.S. was not very, very crazy about having to, to pay to use another system when we provide GPS free to the world. But the uh, Europeans feel that there is a great uh, capability here to generate revenue. It costs a lot of money to build a system. The only way we got GPS was because it came through the Department of Defense and we had the funding to do that and still it took many, many, many years to do that. So that's one of the unique aspects here. And these are some of the, the numbers that uh, the Europeans feel that it's going to cost them and what kind of revenues they think they can generate. Here's GLONASS. Um, again, um, GLONASS was designed to be a three-plane system, as is Galileo. Uh, Galileo will populate with 30 satellites. Uh, GLONASS uh, nominal constellation was 24 satellites in three planes. And um, basically, Galileo had some really rough startup. If you go to the, uh, I'm sorry, GLONASS had a really rough startup. If you go to the GLONASS homepage, for example, you will see the list of all the launches of the GLONASS satellites. And there's a lot of them, although there's only 10 operating on orbit today. Uh, they generally had very low reliability. Uh, they had a very short lifespan. Uh, they probably operated for three years on the outside. Uh, the Russian Federation now has made a commitment to hopefully increase the, the uh, reliability of those satellites and make GLONASS again a, a viable constellation. But that's going to take a lot of work. And uh, it's committed by them over the next 10 years. So, uh, GLONASS is a little different in GPS, even though it does have both military and civil signals. And the fact, GLONASS broadcasts, each signal broad, each satellite broadcasts on a different frequency, where GPS broadcasts on, on the two, the civil L1 CA code, and then the military on the, the L2 code. So there's some very fundamental differences. And we really haven't had um, too much success in negotiating um, with the Soviets so we'll see how, how GLONASS uh, fares over the next few years. Uh, the Japanese are what we're calling now our quasi-Zenith Satellite System, or QZSS. The Japanese have a very unique environment in their part of the world in the fact that they're very high latitude because they're very far north, and they have a lot of mountains and steep canyons, and reception for GPS is particularly bad for them. So they're looking at um, one thing is they have an augmentation system that they're going to add and launch uh, to in, in order to use GPS and provide optimized uh, capability over Japan. But also they're looking at having a follow-on system which will be a Japanese system which will broadcast uh, GPS light signals for a Japanese equivalent to GPS. So it'll be an independent system. And that we're have, having some discussions right now with the Japanese on the compatibility and the interoperability of, of these signals. And um, these, sign these satellites are being placed in geostationary orbit such that they stay in the same spot on the Earth, over the Earth, um, as the Earth rotates. So the satellite is basically stationary over the same, same position. Okay, um, let's see here. Augmentation, um, basically, uh, like I said, uh, the FAA and the Department of Transportation has really led the augmentation systems in the United States to GPS, and they basically boil down into two categories. They're what we call a wide area augmentation system, or WAS, in which um, they're basically using differential GPS, and they're broadcasting those corrections. Uh, the beauty of it is that you don't have to have some kind of a separate receiver to get those corrections. Um, um, usually what happens in a differential station is those corrections are broadcast over another frequency. So you can't get them over your GPS receiver, you have to have another receiver of some kind. And that's how the surveyors operate right now. But the WAS area corrections are broadcast over the GPS frequency such that you can receive them with your GPS receiver. You don't have to have another, another receiver in the system. Uh, the local area augmentations, or loss, 
is basically a differential GPS service, again, broadcast over, over uh, the same frequencies as GPS, but for a localized area. So it's used primarily in close approaches to airports. And um, that system is being fielded right now. And um, I, I guarantee you'll see, uh, right now we have uh, receivers that you can buy on the commercial market that are, you'll see them, see them say that they're WASP capable and they will interface with the WASP signal. Um, if you look carefully on the box too, you might see something that says differential capable. Um, there's also a national uh, differential GPS system or NDGPS, which is being populated by um, the National Railway Authority and it's primarily to help accuracy of rail. There's also a differential system that was promulgated by the Coast Guard for uh, navigation in the littoral regions and along the coasts, and that was done by broadcasting GPS corrections over a, uh, a marine radio beacon frequency and using that frequency to transmit those corrections to GPS. So there's lots of different flavors of what we call differential GPS, <laughs> and we're on the process right now of trying to get, get that under control so everybody knows what's available. They can design receivers that'll take advantage uh, of those high accuracy uh, corrections to give you better GPS performance. Oops, got a blank. There we go. Okay, and this talks about WAS in specific. And uh, basically right now there's about um, 600 approaches um, at about 300 different airports. Um, and the system will continue to be developed and fielded. And WAS will utilize the new GPS signals that we talked about earlier. Um, the other thing too is, like I said, your, your little receivers can be WAS capable and a lot of them are today. So you don't have to be an aviator to take advantage of using the WAS signals. You can just buy an a inexpensive GPS receiver and you don't have to put it in your airplane. And we're looking at also uh, plans to extend the service availability to possibly Canada and Mexico too. So we're in negotiations with those governments. Okay, and Peter put together this pictorial, uh, kind of shows you uh, a loss approach. And again, loss provides very accurate GPS within um, a small area. Uh, the one thing about differential GPS is the fact that uh, when you have your two stations set up, uh, the further your user gets away from the base station, the less accurate it is, okay? So because you're dependent on the fact that you're seeing these common errors and the further you get away from each other, the less common those errors are gonna be. So accuracy goes down. So the loss is decided, is designed to be very, very, very accurate in a, in a, in a localized area, whereas WAS is designed to be accurate in a large geographic area of fundamental differences. Can I ask you a question? Sure. You make a statement here that allows all other approaches in CAT 1, 2, and 3. Are there any CAT 3 approaches now approved? That's pr yeah, that's probably a good question. I, I don't think... Well, why is that question? It, oh, I'm sorry. We restate the question. The question he, is that differential GPS allows instant approaches. We have category one ILS approaches, category two, two and category three. We don't have any and greater and greater accuracy. My question is, does GPS now permit anything other than category one ILS approaches or similar accuracy? I, I can probably answer that. The, um, the ICAO have approved CAT1 GPS approaches. CAT2 uh, and 3 are currently under their uh, ratification, if you like. So there, are, there aren't any CAT2 or approved, approved yet. Approaches. We're working the problem. Yeah. Thank you very much. Okay. And this kind of gives you a summary of where we are with, with loss right now. We kind of alluded to that in terms of the approval of those approaches. Okay. I'd like to close tonight with uh, some interesting applications of GPS. Um, I had kind of some fun putting this one together because I tried to gauge my audience here and try to figure out, I've got a lot of aviators here, so yeah, I think these guys know about airplanes and stuff. So I, I've picked some things that are of, of uh, uh, some more interest to the general public. 
But um, uh, my daughter wants to, she keeps telling me she wants to be a veterinarian and hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll make that happen. But she's really, really into her animals. And um, I thought one of the unique uses of GPS was things like tracking endangered species. Uh, these guys have a GPS uh, uh, positioning collars around uh, these two particular cats. And they were out uh, tracking these cats um, in, in the snow in Mongolia and Central Asia. And the one great thing about GPS at, in, in this particular application is the fact that um, not only you know, were you able to track the cats, but the maps in that part of the world are not real good either. So you don't want to get lost either. So, so that was another feature of, of GPS in terms of uh, this particular application. Uh, these guys here uh, with the grizzly bear, um, this guy's name, uh, the grizzly's name is Garmin. They named him after the, the GPS receiver, okay? <laughs> Anyhow, but he's part of the oil fill grizzly project up in Prudhoe Bay. And um, uh, they're studying here the interaction between the humans and what's happening in the in oil exploration in, Prudhoe, in the Prudhoe Bay area um, and its effect on the bears. And um, they've been very, very pleased with the amount of information they've gotten because they can now track the bears. They know where the bears' dens are. They can avoid those areas uh, and avoid disturbing the bears. And I think in, in the last year this project's been going on, um, only one bear was injured uh, all year long. So they consider that to be a pretty good, pretty good success. So tracking, tracking animals is a, is a unique uh, application of GPS. Um, the visually impaired. Uh, this is a very interesting application. Uh, this gentleman is blind. Um, he has his guide dog, and he has his talking digital map hooked to his GPS receiver. So there's a software package that produces the synthetic voice, uh, the voice synthesizer, so he can actually hear um, the map talking to him, and the inputs are coming from his GPS receiver into the laptop that has the, the, the particular software. And then he interfaces with it to control it and feedback it uh, via his earphones and, uh, and a touch keypad he punches. So um, the, guide, the guide dog, though, doesn't, is not GPS operated. Uh, are, this, this one, I'll go to this one first. Uh, I thought this was particularly interesting, but, but saving your life was a very interesting uh, aspect of this particular GPS receiver. Uh, this is a young Marine in uh, uh, El Nasseri, and this is the actual bullet entry into the pocket of his fatigue, and this is his GPS receiver, which did not survive, but um, uh, actually, it was kind of interesting because uh, the letter uh, to Garmin, in this case, was written by his mother. And uh, his mom said that because he felt this tug at the side of his fatigue when the bullet went through and took out the GPS receiver, he knew in which direction the guy was firing from. So he was able to turn and fire before he put himself in danger. So not actually use of a GPS receiver, but it was a use of a GPS receiver, and I thought, we thought you'd like be interested in that one. Uh, this little Garmin over here, and I'm not doing Garmin commercials because there's, there's a lot of good GPS receivers out there, but this one's got um, uh, the compass uh, display uh, actually pictured right now. And if you look very carefully at this one, uh, this guy's at the South Pole. This is the South Pole marker, and this is the screen. And if you see the, the round earth there, you can see your position being dead on uh, at the South Pole, and it says, you know, 90 degrees, point zero 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 zero. So it, it works at the South Pole, too. Um, I don't know how many have seen this. This was kind of, this one was kind of uh, played up in the media. Uh, this was a Coke advertising commercial, a promotion, and um, the, the lucky person who uh, wound up with this GPS receiver in the Coke can, it was actually plastic, uh, there's also a cellular phone integrated with the GPS receiver, such that the winner was to, to ring, ring the phone, and at the other end, they knew exactly where, where the winner was because they had the GPS receiver, and uh, they were supposed to bring the prize to you. In this case, was um, a new SUV, I think a Chevy or a Ford, I can't remember now, but they were to bring the vehicle to you as, as the winner, so they knew where you were because you had GPS. Uh, one of the interesting uh, uses of GPS is actually in agriculture. Um, there's a big, big industry now in machine control using GPS. And this shows you kind of a typical harvesting uh, activity here. 
But um, in a lot of cases, applying uh, pesticides very precisely and the use of fertilizers um, that can get into the groundwater. So we want to apply these things uh, very carefully and make sure we're not going over the field several times in the wrong area. So GPS helps you to do that. And GPS is actually integrated into the, the piece of farm equipment. Uh, John Deere and now their GPS division is called NAVCOM, and you'll see advertisements for those guys um, actually produce this kind of equipment. The, um, let's see if I've got another one that deals with, with farming. Um, let's see here. Let's talk about the cows first. I'll, I love this one. But um, here are two, two bovines with GPS receivers. Uh, this one's down, down in a collar, kind of blowing. Uh, this one's tied up on the top of his head because the antenna's up there. But um, uh, the GPS receiver in the collar really um, allows the farmers not only to figure out where the cows are, but it also allows them to, to predict their grazing patterns. Where are they going? What are they eating? You know, are they graze overgrazing a particular area, and do we have to try to restore that? Um, you've probably all heard of E911, and this is the extended 911 service, which requires geolocation capability. And there are certain um, uh, uh, distance parameters or accuracy parameters placed on the system, and you can use GPS or an active system or whatever you want to do as long as you meet the requirements. Well, a lot of manufacturers have chosen to use GPS, and a lot of your cellular phones today have GPS receivers embedded in them. And this is to provide the capability for emergency locating and knowing exactly where you are. And this is one of the, the cell phones, and these are kind of some typical shots of the, the moving map display on the receiver and um, the uh, command center for E911. And uh, the folks that are into, into this are the manufacturers like um, Surf, uh, Silicon, Silicon Rectifier Incorporated. Uh, they're a small company that just went public, and uh, they build chipsets because they're not into building cell phones. They have to compete with Nokia and and uh, the other manufacturers uh, in order to do that. So they just build the GPS chipsets that go into the phones, and that's a very big business for them. And it's very interesting because it has to be a very, very low cost business. So it's very, very cost competitive. And I had the opportunity a couple of weeks ago to talk to uh, some of their folks, and they're very, very price sensitive to their product because it has to go into the phone, and the phone's got to be sold very cheaply, or as we all know now, you sign up again and you get a free phone. So. The GPS chips have got to be very economic. Um, last, last little clip here has to deal with um, having some fun with GPS. I just want to go back a second because I want to make one more point for you. Um, one of the other applications for GPS, and I didn't have time to do this one up this morning, uh, that kind of goes along with machine control, is the fact that you can use differential GPS to very accurately determine uh, position or in this case of, say, farm machinery, or not necessarily farm machinery, but construction machinery, you can determine the angle of a blade of a grader. So you can go out there and automatically grade to a set level um, in terms of construction by knowing exactly how the blade set without having to go out, measure, look at, or control from, from the cockpit. Because GPS can be that accurate, it can measure those, those deflections. The other application for that type of application is like on the space station and some of the satellites on orbit right now uh, actually use GPS for attitude determination and control so they know whether, say, for example, they have an antenna, it's pointing towards the Earth or whether the satellite's in trouble and it's going somewhere else. So you can use the GPS on orbit in space to actually determine the attitude and of, of the spacecraft itself, not only its position, too. Uh, another interesting use of GPS is being done um, on our weather satellites. Uh, they fly something we call an occultation sensor, and the occultation sensor actually measures the distortion of the GPS signal across the ionosphere. You've got to remember in space, because the GPS signal is coming from the satellites, the satellites receiving the GPS signal are looking over the cone of the Earth. So they're looking at the satellites that are out there because there's no backside antennas on the spacecraft. And a lot of those spacecraft are higher up in orbit than the GPS satellites. So they're receiving the signal from uh, across the other side of the Earth, basically. 
And um, they measure the distortion of the GPS signal in the ionosphere, I'm sorry, in the troposphere, because that's an indic indi indicator of the amount of moisture in the troposphere. So the weather satellites are using that to help predict things like storms, hurricanes, because now we're, we understand how much moisture is in the atmosphere on a global basis. So that's another very unique use of GPS. So I'll kind of close with some, some fun here. Uh, this is my list of uh, good things to find in your GPS receiver. And uh, I have to thank the folks, I think from Garmin on this one, but these are some of, some of the things you need to think about if you're gonna go down and buy a GPS receiver, whether you want an inexpensive one to, to play with and have fun or just doing some backpacking and hiking, or whether you wanna put it in your car, or whether you wanna spend $20,000 to get a really good one to integrate with your inertial on your, on your aircraft, for example. But, you know, number one is accuracy. You know, you might wanna look to see if it's WAS enabled, and we talked about WAS a little bit earlier because that'll give you greater accuracy. Some of the boxes, the receiver will say differential capable. That's another hint, but it may be another differential system, not necessarily WAS. It could be NDGPS, depending on who is broadcasting those corrections back and at what frequencies. Um, number of waypoints. You wanna remember, you know, this is your breadcrumbs. You're dropping a waypoint here. You'd like to have a, a, a receiver that's got a whole bunch of memory so you can store lots of waypoints so you can find your way back or use it again for another trip. Uh, route mapping. Um, some of your very inexpensive ones, I think your little Garmin e trex I think I read, I think those only have one, they'll only hold one route map. And that's nice if it, you're going out for the day, but if you wanna go several times to the same spot or the same area and you wanna have enough memory to record those, uh, there might be not enough memory in your receiver. So look for that capacity. Uh, internal maps, we saw a lot of the new receivers with uh, map displays on the GPS screen. They've got a lot of capacity built into them where in the old days they were large and huge and bulky, uh, now you can get them in uh, handheld size. Stop right there. Sure. How do you get the software mapped into a receiver? I'm going to use it in my car. Okay. It's so basic, but you have to remember that. Uh, actually, there's several different ways. Number one is some of it's already embedded in the receiver, so it's, it's loaded already. How, how do they, the manufacturer did that and they loaded it into either some kind of volatile memory or non-volatile memory. They actually, it's like your computer when you, it comes already with Windows installed, for example. So that's, that's already there. Now, there are other things that you can add to that, say that that map that you got with your receiver wasn't accurate enough. Maybe you want to add a new set of maps. And that's generally done through something like, oh. You mean the actual production of the yeah. software itself? Okay, the question was, how do they actually produce the software? And um, a lot of that is done through map bases themselves. Um, a lot of that is also done through physical survey. Um, a lot of people have spent a lot of years recently going out there with GPS and surveying the streets uh, to make sure that the maps were correct in the first place. So for a lot of urban areas, a lot of the streets have been re-surveyed and remapped using GPS. I'm oh, sorry. Thank you. Um, let's see, here. memory size and capability, that has again to do with the data um, bases and maps. Uh, usability, um, my wife asked me if I wanted a new cell phone, and I said, well, yeah, our plan's coming up, you know, maybe a new cell phone would be nice, and she says, what kind of a cell phone do you want? You know, one with, you know, 300 memories, or, you know, can record 300 calls, or, you know, what, what, what are you really looking for? And I said, well, I really like this one I got. I, I push the button and I talk. <laughs> so for me, for me, simplicity is, is very important. And, you know, I'm kind of caught in the generation where I'm, I'm kind of old and it's like I'm not real computer savvy sometimes and then sometimes I can muddle my way through it. So simplicity and ease of use, like anything else, is very important. It's kind of like your digital camera. You know, if you can use it and you enjoy it, it, it may be much better for you than buying something that's very expensive and very complex. Um, let's see here, power consumption. How many of you have digital cameras that eat batteries like crazy? Yes, um, that's a big problem. A big problem with the military receivers too. Uh, we showed you the plugger and we have the little, the little Magellan too, which is kind of his counterpart, but it's big. And the Army says, well, why did you make the damn thing so big? Well, if you look at it, uh, there's a circuit card in there for GPS, and the rest of it's battery. The Army gave the Air Force a requirement that said, we have to have a GPS receiver that, that can stay on for three days. You know, if one of our GIs is out there and they forget to turn it off and they leave it on, 
you know, our average platoon uh, expedition is about a three-day mission. Uh, we want it to last three days. Well, the only way that's going to happen is if it's a lithium battery and the thing's this big. So that was not a real good idea. Uh, what happened actually in the field was um, everybody got rid of the lithium batteries and then also the tube was the same size and took D-cells too, so they put the D-cell batteries in there also. But batteries are a big problem for, for GPS receivers and for a lot of electronic applications, so, so think about that. Uh, GPS receivers have a tendency to use a lot of power because the correlators are constantly looking for the code. They're constantly searching the sky to try to find that GPS signal and download that information. So they're running and they generate a solution every second. So it's, it's got a lot of activity. Uh, size, again back to the plugger example, you know, it was kind of big and the Army wasn't real happy. Uh, the other thing that happened too was um, our first prototype of our, our GPS handheld receivers, we call it the plugger, um, were made by Rockwell Collins and uh, they were tan. And we thought that was great, you know, Desert Storm it was, was on at that time, or it was just after Desert Storm. And uh, we thought tan was a great color. Well, the Army went nuts. He said, it's got to be green. No, get rid of these tan ones. We don't want tan ones, you know, green. It's got to be Army green. So we said, okay, we're going to go back and buy green ones. Well, at that point, we had all these tan, tan devices. And we said, how about we give the Army a real good deal on the price? So, so they, they took the deal. <laughs> but um, size is, is, is an issue. And maybe call it. Uh, physical design, you know, is it easy to use? Um, uh, the Army right now, we're in the process of helping the Joint Program Office uh, procure what we call the DAGGER, or the Defense Advanced GPS Receiver, which is more about the size of this remote, which the GIs will like much, much better than our original plugger. But um, I had the wonderful opportunity to put in service the GPS receivers that we used during Desert Storm. And we bought all the commercial receivers that we could buy, the whole production line, for three months from both Trimble and, and Magellan, two major corporations at that time were the only ones really building handheld GPS receivers. And we bought everything that they could build and we sent them um, uh, into Desert Storm. And uh, talk about government bureaucracy, you know, we work contracts and we do all the, the kind of stuff with our contracting officers and make sure everything's legal and everything else. But we bought all those receivers on a letter of contract. It was one page that says, we will buy all your receivers <laughs> Our contracting officer signed it, and we bought all those damn receivers and we put them in a desert storm. Um, I'd like to thank uh, one of the young officers who worked at that time for me. Her name was Laura Lee Ryan. Um, Laura Lee Ryan, because of her work uh, for the Army during Desert Storm, uh, she received the Army Commendation Medal. And for your Army guys, think about how many Air Force people you know that actually got an Army Commendation Medal. So, so she was real special. And so uh, that shows you how much uh, the folks here in Los Angeles in the GPS program office love our troops and support our troops. Uh, let's see here. Last couple of things, and then I'll, I'll do one more little final fun thing, and we'll take uh, questions and answers. Um, the antenna. Um, you'll see two basic kind of antenna designs on the little, little ones that are about the size of the remote here. It has a patch antenna. We call it a patch. And... Um, it's probably not the most superior antenna, but the option is what we call a, a helical, and it's like the little Magellan we have there. It's uh, kind of like long and cigar shaped, and it's, and it's uh, movable, so you can kind of adjust it. Um, but it makes it kind of hard to shove in your pocket, and sometimes the antennas break off, and you, know, you have to kind of trade, trade there also on antennas. Um, the little handhelds are nice too, because you can use those in your car, and you can throw it on the dash, and it works. Um, you don't want to have to be running antennas up to the top of your car, even if they're, they're um, little uh, clip-ons. Um, speed. Um, one thing you'll see is something called number of channels. Uh, a channel is tracking a GPS signal. And like I said, for the civil receivers right now, you're only tracking the CA code on L1. So you're only tracking one code. So the most satellites you're going to ever see in the sky is probably eight or nine at one time. So you can buy a 12-channel receiver, but it's only going to really see eight or nine satellites. So, but the channels will do other things too. They'll download um, ephemeris and clock updates. So generally, the more channels you got, the better. But you know, if it's if it's between that and uh, charge and, and another $400 for the receiver, um, you may want to weigh the number of channels. 
but uh, make sure you get enough to see uh, GPS, uh, GPS satellites uh, that are up there, and that's generally somewhere between five to eight or nine at a time. Um, let's see here. And then power supply, uh, back to batteries and whether you have to have an external uh, uh, power source or you have a battery backup. A lot of the GPS receivers are really neat because they do use a lot of power in most circumstances. They have a sleep function and they have a non-volatile memory, so they'll go to sleep and they'll store all your information until you press the button and wake it back up again. So the sleep function in some of them is, is really kind of cool. Uh, last thing I'd like to talk about tonight is something called geocaching. And geocaching is kind of like hide and seek. And there's a whole network of people out there on the net. And if you check geocaching.com, uh, you can probably uh, communicate with some of these folks. But they are into their GPS receivers. And they play a, uh, an adult hide and seek game. And um, uh, the object of the game is to take your GPS receiver and find those coordinates that are given on the website and go out there and, and find a cache. And there's some kind of little, little treasure chest hidden, usually with a notebook and a little portable, uh, disposable camera and some kind of little trinket to take home to show that you've, you've uh, um, conquered that cache and found the treasure. And uh, so a lot of people are in, into that. And then you can play like hitchhiking where people kind of find caches up and down the, uh, the coast going from Washington State to Southern California. Um, but uh, take a trinket, leave a trinket, and it's kind of a cute little game to play and something to get you outside and enjoy your GPS receiver and, uh, and build your skills on using the, the uh, device. Uh, last commercial, let's see here. I got one more slide, I think. I'm going to do one commercial real quick along those lines. Um, these two books are produced by Trimble. Uh, and uh, if you go to Trimble.com on the web, uh, T-R-I-M-B-L-E, um, they explain GPS really nice in a, in a few pages. Um, the basics of GPS and how differential GPS work. Uh, and, ex and they were the ones that coined GPS the next utility. And they actually call it a utility. Uh, when I was in the Air Force, uh, we gave these to the general officers because they could figure out what GPS was about <laughs> uh, real quick. So, so this, is, this is good for general officers. And I had my friends at Trimble, I called them back up and I said, I need another box of about 200 of these so I could give them out. And they're, they're kind of hedging on that. And I said, yeah, but I've given out more of these than Gideon's probably given out Bibles. So. <laughs> Um, there's also a great publication called GPS World, and of course, here's our, here's our friendly Coke can uh, on the front page again. And um, a lot of these are, especially the, the Trimble books and other publications, are free for the asking. I think on my last chart, I have a couple of websites you can go visit and uh, learn more about GPS. And some of the material here on civil applications were taken from those websites. And basically, the bottom line is, GPS is ubiquitous. It's, it's everywhere. It's, in every, it's everywhere and it's in everything. And it's truly an enabling technology. Uh, the DOD has been a good steward of the system and will continue to do so. Um, when I worked in the program office, uh, one of my things was we, we, had, we started a stewardship program and the fact that <coughs> we wanted to make sure that the American public understood that <coughs> because the DOD sponsored and developed the system, that we were good stewards of the system and that we would continue to provide this service free of charge to the public. And President Clinton, uh, about two years ago, uh, issued another letter re-emphasizing, or uh, another di presidential directive, uh, re-emphasizing the fact that DOD would continue to provide this service free of charge to, to the world. Um, but things have changed. Uh, you know, D, you know, there's going to be more uh, influence um, and direct participation by the civil and government agencies. Uh, we now have something we call the uh, GPS. I'm sorry, the, the Civil GPS Coordination Committee, or SCRC. I'm sorry to think of that. And then there's the IGEB, or the inter, or the Interdepartmental GPS Executive Board, which are two. DOD and Department of Transportation DOT level boards such that DOD and the Department of Transportation technically now co-manage GPS to recognize the importance to the civil user of GPS. So that's a, a big step. Um, but the U.S. is not alone. You know, this is an international service we provide globally. And there's going to be, you know, there's more to global navigation than just GPS. And we talked about GNSS and the other independent systems and the other augmentations to GPS. And but this requires a lot of planning, coordination, and cooperation. And in the political arena, sometimes that's, that's very difficult. But 
we have a, a great international treasure here uh, ourselves, our European friends who are going to develop their system, the Soviet or you know, the, the Russian Republic. Um, you know, those are, are true international treasures. And we have to make sure we do things like coordinate very carefully and make sure that those systems are compatible and hopefully interoperable so they work together and we have much more capability worldwide. And finally, GPS. The use of GPS is only limited by our own imagination. Again, it's an enabling uh, technology. It's what you can do with it. It's not the magic of GPS just itself, but all those things that GPS can do for you. And I think that's the last step. And here's some websites. And, and I'm down at the bottom there. There's my phone number and my uh, uh, email. And Peter's up front here, and we'd be more than happy to answer any questions. And I, I hope you enjoyed the discussion. Thank you very much, Don. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask you to stick around for a minute in case anybody has uh, any questions that they want to ask you. But I would like to also thank you whoops, for helping us kick off our uh, 27th uh, Aerospace Lecture Series. And as a token of our appreciation uh, for your traveling needs, uh, we have a thermos, a travel thermos with the museum logo on one side and the AIAA logo on the other side. And it comes with a little carrying case and everything like that. I want to thank you very much for uh, helping us out to us. kick off the lecture series. And I would like to make sure also everyone knows that the test will begin in five minutes after <laughs> a short break. And the blue books and the number two lead pencils are on the tables just outside. Uh, but thank you for a really fact-filled uh, uh, treatise on, the, on GPS. And uh, we really appreciate your helping us out. Well, well, Peter and I thank you very much for having us. Um, we like spreading the word about GPS. We feel very strongly about it. And you guys have a wonderful museum here and a wonderful program, you know, not only for the education, but the open forums like this. And uh, anytime you'd like us to come back, we'd be more than happy to do that. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to ask Don and uh, Peter to stick around for any questions. Please remember that uh, our next uh, uh, lecture is October the 21st with uh, astronaut Walter Cunningham. Again, at 7.30 p.m. We'll see you then. Thanks very much for coming. Drive safely, please. We'll play out there. And Peter. I also yeah. have there you, go. Go. I have a you may ask as many questions as you want. Like. Uh, and here, let me try. Mm -hmm. yeah. How much fuel is that? Um, actually, they, the fuel that the spacecraft uses for attitude determination and control for, for basically station keeping is, is hydrogen. Is hydrogen. And uh, they have enough on board to maintain the spacecraft throughout its projected life. Actually, um, the design life for yeah, what's the name of it? GPS the next utility, and this one's called differential. Uh, but actually, they they figure out life expectancy of the spacecraft, and make sure they have enough, enough fuel to do what they consider to be nominal operation. You mentioned the Russians are only good maybe for about three. How much are they Oh, ours are good for, um, actually, some of those, um, the oldest GPS satellite we have lasted almost 18 years. Oh, yeah. Well, see, that's part of the problem, too, because if you want to make any changes, like we're talking about new signals and having new stuff for civil capability, if the satellites last, there's a hesitancy to turn them off. Nobody wants to turn off a good GPS satellite. So it makes it hard to do what yeah, we sure. call refreshing the technology and getting getting things. And up that cost there. of a satellite, including the launch, is um, let's see here. Roughly, I, I'd say roughly 100 million. Yeah, that's including the that's launch. Including the launch. Yeah, and that's yeah, all funded DoD. It's all funded DoD. Um, it's all built in our in our budget. Um, it's about roughly about uh, the GPS satellite itself is about 50 million. The launch is about 50 about, million. Oh, that's so it's about about 100 million. I very much appreciate it. Well, I'm glad. Thank you. Nice to have. Hi, Bruce. Oh, I ask you a simple question. You can ask me a simple question. I have two cars okay. that have uh, I don't know if they're Garmin, whatever they are, and also a boat. And so I've got three of them, and they're being received, I, I assume, by a one. Yes. Now, yes. now, as time goes on, you said we're switching from L1 to L2. Uh, will the uh, will the change will the make change, change the receiver? No.